Today on the calendar is the eve of Passover. Okay, Tonight at sundown starts Passover. And this is an ancient celebration that the Israelites or the Jews, they celebrate and it's a time that they, they retell the history of leaving the uh, slavery in Egypt under Pharaoh and they were set free when God showed up and, and he set them free. Also today as Christians is Good Friday. This is the day that we celebrate when Jesus Christ hung on a cross and died for our sins. The thing about what we're getting ready to participate in, this, this Passover meal, this Seder meal, is that this meal forever linked these two events. It forever took the exodus that the Jews celebrate with their freedom and linked it with the freedom that we received in Jesus Christ from Him dying on the cross. And again, this will, will come to light as we go through this tonight. Again, I want to keep, you to keep that in mind that that's our, our, where we're heading to tonight. Now this is a Passover meal and this is again, it's called a Seder meal. Seder means order. Okay? It means order. And the reason it's called a Seder meal is because there's a very specific way that this meal progresses. You have elements in front of you there that we will explain throughout the evening tonight. Okay? And it is a very orderly fashion we go through these elements. They've been doing it this way for thousands, literally thousands of years. They've been celebrating this Seder meal this way. Which means that Jesus Christ, as a Jew, celebrated the Passover meal this way. Very much the same way that we're going to celebrate it tonight. With a Seder meal. And in fact, what we call the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper, or Communion, was really, it's, a, it's an abbreviated version of this meal that we're going to have tonight. Now they didn't go through in the Gospels and explain all the details of it because they were writing to Jewish people who understood. And so again, by going through this, we're going to understand what Jesus was doing that night with his disciples. Uh, I want to point out the scripture does say that this was a Passover meal in Matthew 26. 17, it says, On the first day of the feast festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Again, you have uh, bulletins there with you, and, and uh, a lot of what I'm going to be saying is an outline form there. If you uh, want to follow along, feel free. Also in Luke chapter 22, it says, And he said to them, I have eagerly desired, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So this was a Passover meal that Jesus was having with his disciples. Now finally, before we light the festival candles, tradition tells us that we should, in going through this, consider ourselves as slaves in Egypt. We can, should consider ourselves as the Israelites who were in bondage and suffering and in slavery. And in so doing, as we celebrate the Exodus, we celebrate our own deliverance. And as we see this meal tie together the Exodus for the Jews and the crucifixion of Jesus, we will realize that we are celebrating our freedom. It was given to us through the cross. Now it's customary in traditional Passover for a married woman of the house to light two candles to begin the holiday. We have a married woman who's going to assist us in this and she's going to light two candles. One is in reverence to Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 that says, Remember the Sabbath. The, this holiday is considered a Sabbath day regardless of what day it falls on. The other candle is lit in reverence to Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 12. It says, observe the Sabbath. After she lights the candle, she spreads her hands around the flames and she draws them in towards her three times, which is indicating the acceptance of the sanctity of the Passover. Then she covers her eyes for the following blessing. We praise you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has preserved our life so that we may again celebrate this festival. 
And as we kindle the festival lights, we pray for the light of God in our midst, that we might see anew the meaning and significance of the celebration. Amen. Thank you. She then uncovers her eyes and she beholds the Passover lights. And as a woman has been chosen to begin our Seder by giving light to our table, God chose a woman, Mary, to shed light upon the world. He chose a woman to give His light of redemption and salvation to us. Tonight as we see the candles glowing on our tables, we remember that our Messiah is the light of the world. We discussed uh, several Sundays ago, if you were here, that there is a preparation phase that goes into this Passover, this meal. And this preparation phase is a process of going through your home and removing anything that has leaven in it. All leavened bread, any, any food that has leaven in it. And, and the, the Orthodox Jews still practice this to, today. They will go through and, and they will either give away or sell or throw away anything at all that has leaven. And they check under couches, they clean out their closets, they get into the corners and, and, and all the nooks and crannies of the house to make sure that they remove the leaven. Now there's a reason for this because leaven is symbolic of sin. Throughout scripture, leaven is a, 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 a symbol of sin. And so in preparing for this feast, we should have taken time to search out our lives, to search all the nooks and crannies, to look for all the places and say, Lord, I see that I have sin and I want to remove it from my life. Now as much as we try to do this, as much as we seek and look for leaven or sin, sometimes it hides beyond our, our view. And so we say this prayer. Lord, any leaven that may remain among us, which we may not have seen, that we may not have removed, may it be as if it does not exist, as if it is the dust of the earth. As the book of 1 Corinthians tells us, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the leaven, unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Amen. I want to draw your attention now to a glass of juice or wine that's sitting in front of you. There's going to be four glasses of wine that we will drink throughout this meal. These four glasses come from a passage in Exodus that reads, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. There are four I will statements in this passage. And these four glasses represent those four I will statements. The first is I will bring you out. It is called the cup of freedom. The second one is I will deliver you. It is called the cup of deliverance. The third is I will also redeem you. And that is called the cup of redemption. And the fourth says I will take you for my people. And this is the cup of thanksgiving for fulfilling his promises that allow us to be his people. Now as we take the first cup, you will take the first cup. <clears throat> this is the cup of freedom. We remember that the freedom the Israelites received from their bondage in Egypt, from their slavery in Egypt. We also remember the freedom that we receive because of our Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who has created the fruit of the vine. And blessed are you, O Lord our God, who has sustained us and enabled us to reach this season in the first cup. Before the second cup, if you all, there's a canter of, of wine or juice on the table there. If you all would like to pass that around, fill yourselves another cup. Uh, you may want to do that over a plate. Just to help with uh, the tablecloths there. And I will continue on while you're doing that. We come to a portion now before we delve into the elements of washing our hands. 
Now this is a symbolic washing of hands. Okay, this is not a literal washing of hands, so you don't need to sit and look at your neighbor and point out their fingernails or anything like this. This is symbolic. Psalms 24 tells us, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. On this night when Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples, this evening when we read through the account of Jesus' Passover meal, we see that at this point in the meal, Jesus stops. He got up from the table and he laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Jesus interrupted the ritual of the Seder, the ritual of the order. Jesus interrupted it. And what he was stating by this is he was telling his disciples, pay attention. This meal is going to be different. I'm taking you out of your comfort zone because as a good, faithful Jew, you're used to doing this the same way every time. And Jesus is saying, I want you to pay close attention to this meal. And he pointed out, and, he, and he's, by example, he showed that the way to clean hands and a pure heart is through humility and service. Because after he had done that, he told his disciples, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. At this point, you have a bowl and a towel uh, and a, a jar or a glass of, uh, of water on your table. If one of you could take that and to the person to your left pour some water over their hands as a symbolic washing of their hands and they can then dry their hands and proceed around the table until everyone has washed their hands. now draw your attention, while some of you are finishing up, to the plate before you. You have a plate with elements on it, and there are two sets of elements on this plate. And there are, these two sets, they are contradictory. There is karpos, or what we call parsley. There is a cup of salt water. One of the Cups contains a mixture which is known as cheroset, which is a mixture, a sweet mixture of apples and honey and nuts. And the other is a bitter mixture called maror. So we have the, the, uh, the symbolism of something sweet and something bitter. And these things are to point out life to us. And the fact that life is not always sweet, but there are many times when, when there are tears mixed in with life, and there are bitter things that we must uh, partake in in life. These con uh, contrasting elements serve to remind us that life is often this confusing mixture of joy and sorrow. And it's not our goal to eliminate the negative. It is not our goal to, to pretend as if the negative doesn't exist, and to uh, gloss over it. First of all, that's a, a futile task, and, and ultimately it's, it's dishonest for us to try to do that. Rather, our goal is to rejoice in the fact that God works in all the circumstances of life. Now, if we will take the, the karpas, the green vegetable, this represents life, created and sustained by the Lord our God. We are filled with joy at the goodness of God in loving us and caring for us and bringing us life and all good things. 
And yet, as good as God intended life to be, it's often mixed with tears. Today, we're not simply celebrating, celebrating life or love. We're celebrating the freedom and wonderful deliverance that God brought to the slaves in Egypt in the book of Exodus and to us today as believers in Christ. But we do not forget that even in a life in Christ, that oftentimes life has tears. Life has difficult times. Life can be filled with pain and suffering. But let us never forget that the struggle for freedom begins in suffering and that life is sometimes immersed in tears. This screen partially also reminds us of the high sup that was used during the original Old Testament Passover. The book of Exodus tells us, You shall take a bunch of high sop and dip it in the blood of the slain lamb, which is in the basin, and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and to the two doorposts. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your house and to smite you. The salt water is symbolic of the tears shed by the Jewish people in the land of Egypt because of their affliction. And it's also symbolic of the tears that we shed as people who are enslaved to sin, who are once enslaved to sin. As believers in Jesus, we see that the book of John 19 tells us and explains the Karpas beautifully and when it likens it to the high sop. It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Thus, our Messiah experienced the sorrow and pain of our sins. He became our sacrifice through his death. And to him be all the glory now and forever. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the earth. You now take the parsley, dip it into the salt water, and eat. We now reach one of my, my favorite portions of this meal. Because also, you'll see in the middle of your table, there's a stack of matzah. There are three pieces of matzah in the middle of your table. Now, the Jews have always had a difficult time explaining why they use three pieces of matzah. And again, they've done this for thousands of years. Depending upon who you ask, they may have different explanations. They, they all agree that this is a sign or a symbol of unity. But some will tell you that it means Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some will tell you that this means the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the congregation. Some will say that this is the crown of learning, the crown of priesthood, and the crown of kingship. But we, with the light of Christ and the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, we're able to look at these three pieces of unleavened bread, these three pieces of matzah, and we're able to see our triune God. We're able to see the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, making this even more apparent is this next custom. The leader at each table, if you will take the middle piece of matzah out of the stack... Now this is the middle piece, the sun, in a, in a symbol of the Trinity, the, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I want to draw your attention to this, this matzah because you can see that the way that it was prepared, it's been pierced, it has holes in it. You can also see the way that it's prepared, it has stripes on it, the way it was baked. Isaiah 53 tells us that our Messiah would be pierced for our transgressions and by his stripes we are to be healed. This unleavened piece of bread, this symbol of sinlessness 
the middle piece, the sun, is now broken. One half of this middle piece, one half of this middle piece, the, this unleavened bread, the sun, is then wrapped in a napkin, wrapped in a cloth, It is then taken and hidden away or buried. And leaders, if you would sit that underneath of your chair. Now here's an interesting thing about this piece of bread. This is a Hebrew celebration. This Passover is, is done by the Jews who speak entirely of a Hebrew language. Out of this entire ceremony, this one piece, it's called the Afikomen. This one thing out of this entire ceremony is called by a Greek name, not Hebrew. This one thing, this middle piece, this broken middle piece, sinlessness, the sun, this one Greek thing is the one bridge to a Gentile world out of an entirely Hebrew celebration. And it comes hidden away. And Afikomen is Greek and it means the one to come later or that which will come. Now it is usually at this point in the celebration when a child interrupts. Why? <laughs> Thank you. Good job. Right on cue. There we go. It's usually at this point in celebration that a child inter interrupts the service to ask several very important questions. Now, the Bible tells us that our children will ask us questions about who God is and who we are as their people. And it is an honor and a privilege for us to be able to sit our children down and tell them about the freedom that God has given us about the things that God has done throughout history to bring us to a place of freedom. This is a privilege. It's a privilege to answer the questions of Passover and to recount the gracious acts of our God. The questions that are asked at the Passover Seder is number one, why is this day different than all other days? Number two, why on all other days do we eat bread with leaven, but on this day we eat only unleavened bread? Number three, why on all other days do we eat all kinds of herbs, but on this day we eat bitter herbs? And number four, why on this night do we eat reclined, when on all other nights we eat sitting or reclining? The first question is, why is this day different than all other days? We've gathered here today. Passover is a day where we gather to remember. Keep that in mind. We gather to remember. That's why this day is different than all other days. That is the purpose of what we are doing tonight. To remember. We gather to remember what God has done for us. And to tell the story of God's grace and deliverance. The Bible tells us that Israel became slaves to Egypt. They labored. They made bricks out of clay and straw. God came down and he talked to Moses and he told Moses, I want you to go and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And so Moses went to the Pharaoh and Pharaoh just increased the labor upon the Israelites. And so then God brought down ten plagues upon the Pharaoh and upon all of Egypt in order to compel them to let the Israelites go. If you haven't refilled your second cup, go ahead and refill your second cup. Then take your second cup. Don't drink. In a moment we will drink it. Because this is the cup of deliverance. This is the cup 
that celebrates the statement from God that says he will deliver us. This is the cup that we use to celebrate the fact that Israel was delivered out of bondage from Egypt. This is the cup that we use to celebrate the fact that we are delivered through what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. A full cup is a symbol of joy. But our joy is diminished. Because the Egyptians are also God's children. And suffering from a Pharaoh's evil ways, all of the people suffered loss in order to bring about the release of God's people from slavery. So we do not rejoice at the death of any of God's children. As we recount the plagues, there were ten plagues, as we recount them, what we will do is take our finger, we will dip it into our second cup, and we will put one drop on a napkin to recall the loss caused by each of these plagues. Our finger is to represent the finger of God's judgment on sin. And the first plague was the plague of blood. The second plague was the plague of frogs. The third plague of lice. The fourth plague of swarms. Cattle disease. Boils. Hail. Locusts. Darkness. And death of the firstborn. Long ago in Egypt, innocent people suffered because of the decisions of one man, of the Pharaoh. We still live in a world today where there's evil. We still live in a world today where people suffer because of the decisions of a few. All we need to do is pick up our daily newspapers and watch the evening news and we see stories about hatred and sin and war. We cannot celebrate God's deliverance for ourselves without longing for His deliverance for all the world. So we will spill one more drop from our cups to recall the cost of evil in our world today. Pharaoh continued to refuse to let the people go until that last plague, the death of the firstborn. It convinced him to release the people by following God's instructions put in putting the blood of a slain lamb upon the doorposts. The people of Israel avoided that plague. When God saw the blood of a sacrificed lamb, then he passed over that home and their children were safe. Now I turn our attention. Each table has one bone on the table. This is a shank bone of a lamb, unbroken shank bone of a lamb. This is a symbol of the Passover lamb that was killed so that the children might live. It reminds us of God's wonderful grace in providing for us life and not death. In Christ's day, this was the unbroken shank bone of a lamb. It reminds us that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. And even despite his cruel and torturous death, not a single bone of his body was broken to fulfill prophecy. Today the Jews no longer use a lamb's bone because the temple has been destroyed. They're unable to make sacrifices. We as Christians know that sacrifice of Jesus, as the book of Hebrews tells us, was, was the one sacrifice for all time. And its sacrifice is no longer necessary. Today the Jewish nation feels it's impossible because they have to have their temple to sacrifice in and we know it's unnecessary because of Jesus Christ. And I turn your attention towards the egg. 
you have one bowl with an egg in it. This egg symbolizes that fact. It's a symbol of mourning. And it's to remind us that the temple in Jerusalem, the place of sacrifices, is no longer standing. And so sacrifices are no longer offered. But since it has no beginning, this egg has no beginning and no end, it's also a symbol of hope, of new life. It reminds us that God's grace is not confined to sacrifices in a temple. If you'll join with me now in taking a bite of the egg. The second question says, Why on all other days do we eat bread with leaven, but on this day we eat only unleavened bread? Today we eat unleavened bread because when in Israel, when Israel was in Egypt, God told them, Be ready to leave. You must be ready to go when God gives the signal and tells them to leave. See, this is a, something that had to be done in haste. And they needed to be ready. They couldn't be bogged down or weighed or, or delayed by anything. The process of putting leaven in bread takes time. When you put leaven in the dough of a bread, you have to allow it time to rise. And God was telling them, you can't take that time. You can't waste time. You have to be ready to go. So, he required them. Unleavened bread. Do not put leaven in your bread. Bake it while it is flat. For us as Christians, it reminds us to live our lives lightly. Do not be weighed down by the sin of the world and the, and the promises of the world around us and, and riches and things that, that moths eat and rust destroys. It also tells us that there will come a time when God will call and we should be ready. And at a moment's notice, we should be ready to answer God, to turn aside. Ultimately, there will come a day, in the twinkling of an eye, like a thief in the night, that Jesus Christ will return. And we must be ready to go. We must be ready to go home. We've also seen that leaven is a symbol of sin, and it's the middle piece of the matzah that represents Jesus Christ, our sinless Savior. Since the temple is destroyed, there is no longer a sacrifice. We, they can no longer uh, perform the sacrifice of a lamb. The middle piece of matzah has come to represent our Savior, Jesus Christ. At your tables, if you will take the top piece of matzah and the remaining middle piece of the matzah, if you will take and break off two pieces for yourself and then pass it to those around you. So everyone has two pieces. This brings us to the third question, which says, Why on all other nights do we eat all kinds of herbs, but on this day we eat bitter herbs? This is something that was commanded in the book of Exodus. God commanded, when they remember this day, He said, Eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Exodus 12.8 Now, if you take one of your pieces of bread... In a moment, we're going to dip this into the dish that looks kind of like mashed potatoes in front of you there. These are bitter herbs. Not yet. Hold on. I know you're excited and just want to eat it, but hold on just a minute. Today we eat bitter herbs to remember the bitterness of slavery. <coughs> Israel was in slavery to Pharaoh. It was a bitter time. It was hard conditions. It was ugly. As sweet as our lives are now, we cannot forget that they were in bondage and in slavery. We also need to remember that as Christians, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, there was a time when you were in bondage to sin. There was a time when, when your life was bitter from the ravages 
of what sin can, can, can do to our lives and can tear apart in our lives. We must never forget that so that we will not revert back to it. We're going to dip this bread into our bitter herbs and they will probably bring tears to your eyes. <laughs> These tears are a reminder about the tears that were shed in Israel. The, the things that they endured during their slavery. And it also remembers, reminds us of the tears that we shed of a life enslaved to sin. We also, I want to I wanna point out that in the Gospels when we read about the Last Supper of Jesus, there was a time when, when, when the Gospels talked about this very moment, these bitter herbs... Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him and therefore Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately. The bitterness that we partake in now is a reminder of the bitterness of betrayal that our Lord suffered that evening. You can dip into the maror. Nice, big piece of it. And eat. We praise you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has made us holy with your word and has commanded us to eat bitter herbs. <laughs> I catch my breath, huh? Know? <clears throat> you have another bowl. It's kind of like Thanksgiving stuffing. This bowl is called Cheriset. As we're reminded of the bitterness of our slavery, so too are we reminded of the hope that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. This Cheriset is a sweet mixture. It has apples and honey. It symbolizes the mixture of clay and the straw that the Israelites used to make bricks while they were slaves. But it also reminds us that on this night when Jesus was to be betrayed and receive the bitter treatment of the cross, that God has added a sweet victory to that bitterness. And it's a free gift to all. We have a hope in the future. God has sweetened the misery. Often life is a mixture of the bitter and the sweet, sadness and joy. Let us now add the sweetness of the caroset to the bitterness of the marar. We dip into the caroset to remind us of the sweetness that God can bring into the most bitter of our circumstances. We can sing a new song of praise because of His grace. And God's grace is always enough. Amen. I'm now going to read five statements. Five statements of God's grace. Grace is undeserved favor. Undeserved favor. It's a gift. As such, we recognize that any grace, any grace whatsoever that God bestows upon us, is enough. It would have been enough. Because it is undeserved favor. The Hebrew word dayenu means it would have been enough. As I read these statements, I would like you all to respond with dayenu. If God had only led his people out of Egypt, it would have been enough. But he did more. If he had only parted the sea, it would have been enough. 
But he did more. If he had only fed them in the wilderness, it would have been enough. But, but he did more. If he had only given his holy word, it would have been enough. And we as Christians, we can add a final verse to this, which reminds us of how God saw a sinful people and yet loved them enough to give his only son. At just the right time, when we were all still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Dianu. It's because of this sweetness, this grace offered by God, that we can answer the fourth question. The fourth question is, why on this night do we eat reclined when on all other nights we eat sitting or reclining? We eat reclined because God has delivered us. God has delivered us. Since the freedom from Egypt, the Passover has been celebrated in relaxation. In total contrast to that first Passover in Egypt, when they had to dine standing and with their, with their loins girded and ready to go. It's another reminder of God's grace on our lives and of the coming rest that we will have in His eternal kingdom. We can now take the second cup that we had earlier. With the second cup, we celebrate the deliverance that God has brought to us. We're privileged to thank God, to praise Him, to reverence Him, to rejoice in His grace. He has brought us forth from bondage to freedom, from sorrow to joy, from darkness to light, from slavery to redemption. We praise you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the earth. Let us now drink the second cup, the cup of deliverance. Again, if you would like to go ahead and refill your cups. It's that at this point that in a traditional Seder that we break to eat a full meal. But to keep with the flow and the understanding of what we're doing, we're going to finish the elements. And when we have completed this portion of the elements of the Seder, that's when we will break and have our meal. But it's important to note that, that this is the traditional spot for the meal. The Jews set an extra place at the table during Passover. We have an extra place here. The expectation is high in this season. It's during Passover when, when the Jews have this, this high expectation that their Messiah will come. The empty seat is an anticipation of Elijah who is to herald the coming of the Messiah. We set an empty place not for Elijah but for the returning Christ. I'm going to now invite the children in, or at least wave at them. And what the children are going to do at this point in the meal, what they do is they find and search for the afikoman. Okay? Now I'm going to tell you guys, there is pieces of matzah that look like this that are wrapped in napkins and they are hidden under some of the chairs at all of these tables. So you guys find one of these pieces, hand it to somebody at the table, and then you come and see me. This is the time now that we reveal that which was hidden. We'll find the afikoman, and with the afikoman we can conclude our meal. This afikoman has traditionally symbolized hope for the future. It's a symbol of redemption. It means that which is to come. And Christ is the one who having been broken, we wait in anticipation for his second coming. Did you find one? Here, come over here. Did you find one? Good job. Thank you, sir. Did you find one? Thank you. Good job. Did you find one? Yeah. There you go. What you? Did you get one? Did you find one? Good job. There you go. And I'm now giving them the redemption price for the afikoman. I found You did? 
There you go. Did you find any more? Do you see any more anywhere? I found a lot. You found a lot? Mm -hmm. Okay. There you go. Oh, thank you so much. Here you go. Wait a minute. Wait, you did get your prize. <laughs> get a prize. There you go. Got the redemption price. Uh, remember I got a lot? You got a lot? <laughs> I got one, two. Hold on one minute, okay? Because you help me out, so hold on a minute. Here you go. Thank you so much. There you go. There's one for you. Did you find one? There you go. These aren't chocolate. Don't eat them. Do you see any more anywhere? I found if you can, If you can stand right... Okay, if you can stand right where you are and find one more... There you go. Good job. I found one. There, good job. There you go. Good job. All right. There you go. You since you found two. Thank you, and you helped me out. There you go. Thank you so much. All right. Let's give the kids a let's give it kids a round round of applause there. I want to point out that this is all part of the traditional Seder. Okay, this is all, we're not adding this stuff in because it's cute. The children find the afikoman, that which was hidden away, and they get a redemption price for that afikoman. As the children search, and as they hand them back to you, remember, that this was the middle piece, the middle piece of unleavened bread, representing the sun that was broken and put away or buried. And now, as we approach the time when we have our third cup, as a reminder of the three days, we look to the Sapphic Homing and the third cup. This is where I want to pause. This is where I want to bring special attention. Because we have grown up, if you've grown up in any kind of Christian church, and you've taken communion all your life, these are the things that Jesus Christ held in His hands 2,000 years ago to celebrate what we call the Last Supper. He held the afikomen and the third cup of the meal to institute what we have become so familiar with. This third cup is the redemption cup. This bread, again, is the afikomen, the one to come. It's, it's, it's a broken piece a sinless, leavenless bread. It's been pierced by his stripes on it, by his stripes we were healed. He held this in his hand. And, and this, this ancient feast of Passover, of Seder, he brings a full and clear understanding to what they've been doing all of those years. God commanded them to do this, to remember the freedom that they were given by God. God said, do this to remember. Remember, this is why we gather tonight. To remember. God said, do this Passover feast to remember your freedom. The sacrifice pictures the Passover lamb. <coughs> Scripture tells us that Jesus said this. This is my body. This middle piece of matzah is my body. This, this piece that was broken, this is my body. This, this piece that has no sin in it, this is my body. 
which is for you. He said, do this in remembrance of me. You now take a piece, break it, and pass it and share it. After the meal, you have the third cup. This is the cup of redemption. God says, I will redeem you. This is, redemption means rescue. It means deliverance. It means liberation. It means salvation. This is the, the third cup. It represents three days that Jesus spent in the grave. This is the third cup. This is the one that Jesus used to institute a new covenant. This is the one that represents His blood shed for us. Right, in many Jewish homes, this cup, this third cup, it served warm. Christ offers us redemption through the cross and through the empty grave. Again, pause for a minute. 2,000 years ago, at the Last Supper, this is the cup that Jesus held. And the book of Corinthians tells us in the same way He took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup the cup of redemption is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Third cup. Our redemption is complete. The story of God's redemption, though, has not ended. We celebrate what God has done in our history, what He's done for us, what He's did for Israel. But at the same time, we still wait for a new future. All creation still groans and longs for its final redemption. As Jesus left, He promised He would come again and restore all things. We have faith enough to believe that God will not leave the world the way it is, so we wait for that day that He will come again and bring His kingdom in its fullness. After the third cup, the Gospel of Matthew tells us about the fourth cup. Jesus makes a statement about the fourth cup. He says, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus did not drink the fourth cup that night. The fourth and final cup is the cup of thanksgiving. Jesus didn't take part of that because he was still working. He is still working. He's still working to bring about every person, every person home to God as his child. On the day when we all gather around the Father's throne, when we all gather around his table in that kingdom, on that day, that's when Jesus will give thanks. We raise our glasses a fourth and a final time. This cup of thanksgiving for God's enduring grace and love to us. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has adopted us as your children and allowed us to call you Father.
both go. We've reached the conclusion of the ceremonial part of this evening and we're getting ready to partake in our meal. Uh, and if you are a server, if you would like to go ahead and head towards the back. Meanwhile, I would like everyone else's help in saying grace over the meal. We've talked about God's grace and how God delivered Israel and how God has delivered us through the cross and how God has, has, has bestowed upon us such beautiful and wonderful things through, through Christ's resurrection. And that is all grace, undeserved grace. And there's not a more fitting way to say grace over our meal than to sing Amazing Grace. And I'm going to put someone on the spot and ask if they will lead us. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first Father, Lord, we give you thanks and praise and we thank you for this, this, this meal tonight. We thank you for the elements that we've shared in, for opening our eyes to what it is that, that you've done for us through Jesus. Lord, I ask that you would bless the food that we have before us, that you would strengthen our bodies with it, that you would enrich us, that you would enrich us not only with the food but with the, the friends that we gather with to eat, and that you would enrich us also, Lord, with your spirit. We thank you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. In Exodus 12, thanks Donnie, appreciate it. In Exodus 12, we have a scriptural injunction that says, Now we shall eat it in this manner. With your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And during that Passover evening, almost 3,500 years ago, the children of Israel had to eat in haste. But now, now we can recline and we can relax and we can remember and rejoice that the Lord Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb for time and all eternity. So enjoy your Passover supper and with the Jewish blessing, good appetite and good health.